this lecture is from Sethi Matai. Dr. Matai is a UC Berkeley grad, and she is currently completing a ocular surface disease in clinical research fellowship at the Perriman Institute in Seattle. Um, today, she is going to be speaking with us about a new application of using intense pulse light therapy for dry eye. I'm Sathi Mighty from the Perryman Eye Institute in Seattle, I'm giving a talk today about intense pulse light IPL therapy um, for dry eye. So do you have just a few financial disclosures, so social media affiliate, um, actually kind of a bad influencer, so I think I made like 20 bucks from this, but of course I'll still disclose it. Um, did also want to give a special thank you um, to my boss, Laura Perryman, um, who was one of the pioneers of using IPL for dry eye for allowing me to use a number of her images and slides in this presentation. Um, and did also want to shout out to Eyes on Eye Care because the way I actually applied for the job working for Dr. Perryman um, was through what's called Covalent Careers um, back about a year and a half ago. Um, so thank you to Eyes on Eye Care. So this is just kind of an outline of what we will talk about today, um, going through kind of, you know, brief overview of dry eye into diagnostic tools and treatments, some background about IPL and proposed mechanisms, um, how to implement it into clinic and choosing candidates actually going through the procedure itself, um, and then onto some cases and future possibilities. So can you even have a dry eye talk if it doesn't start with uh, the TFOS DUS2 definition? Um, so there's a couple of things. I think all of us are probably pretty familiar with this, but just wanted to point out a few key aspects of it. The loss of homeostasis, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, and neurosensory abnormalities um, are all critical. So my Bowman gland dysfunction, uh, we know, is one of the key contributors to dry eye disease and evaporative dry eye. Um, it is thought to have a pretty high incidence rate, up to 70%, and it's a multifactorial problem that requires multifactorial treatment options. Um, what's particularly relevant to IPL as a treatment is its relation to rosacea. So we know that you know about one in 10 people have facial rosacea, a very high percentage of those patients have MGD. And it's also thought that it's very possible that the ocular symptoms actually precede the facial um, signs. And so uh, there's probably a quite a high number of our MGD patients that actually do have some component of facial and ocular rosacea. Um, and IPL has actually been shown to be an effective treatment and is actually one of the TFOS dues to level two recommendation. So I know for a lot of people, IPL is kind of thought of as this new treatment. It was being used off label for a long time. And you're kind of wondering, like, should I even consider implementing this into practice? Um, but it has been shown um, to be a level two recommended treatment. As we know, inflammation plays a big part in dry eye. And we have this um, double vicious cycle that was described by Badwan. So it's pretty widely accepted and understood that inflammation plays a key role in initiating and perpetuating dry eye. In MGD, we have this inflammatory cycle that's created that can lead potentially to the development of abnormal blood vessels known as telogenectasias. These abnormal blood vessels release pro-inflammatory mediators, you know, that can get to the eyelids and meibomian glands that further escalate inflammation. Then we have our um, demodex mites and bacteria that flourish in that inflamed tissue and, you know, contribute to the stasis and clogging of those meibomian glands. That then contributes to that lipo lipid layer dysfunction, evaporation of the tears increases, osmolarity of the tear film increases, and then we have the, the irritation and damage to the corneal surface, and the cycle just continues. So this uh, next slide just kind of goes over you know, that cycle where in a normal system, you'll have, you know, the initiation after the injury or loss of homeostasis, the amplification, recruitment, and then resolution. Um, but with the dry eye, we have that disre dysregulated adaptive um, system. And so it just cycles around. 
this next slide. Don't worry, you don't need to know all the details. I know you're probably like looking at all these interleukins and some of your eyes are glazing over. Um, but this just shows where um, some of our more common treatment options work in that system. So um, these arrows here, the green, maroon, and purple are corticosteroids and immunomodulators where they target and help versus what um, I want you to focus on is these little blue stars. That is where IPL will target um, and help reduce that inflammation. And this is just another um, visual that shows, again, the different areas where IPL works. So dry eye, you know, I think it's been really underestimated in the past, but we're now starting to realize the, the true burden that it has, you know, both on patients and doctors, as well as just society as a whole. You know, we see really severe dry eye patients in our clinic and dry eye isn't just a little thing that's kind of bothering them from time to time. It is something that people are thinking about and it's affecting their lives all the time, their quality of life. Some people, it affects their ability to sleep, their ability to work, to do everything where, you know, we have patients that really have real anxiety and depression. We've had patients say, you know, even have suicidal ideation related to their dry eye. Um, and, and it certain effect, certainly affects functionality, productivity, aesthetically, it can bug patients. And then there's a real real time and financial burden. You know, dry eye treatment is really expensive. It takes a lot of time. Same for the doctors. You know, you know you're seeing dry eye patients. That exam is going to be more complicated and take more time. Financially, this is taking up a lot of our chair time. It's also, we are having to take time to do things like prior authorizations and we're prescribing drugs. It can affect our surgical outcomes and referrals. And then on society as a whole, when you take into account all the sort of lost productivity um, and then just the cost insurance, it, it's, you know, this is a billion in the billions of dollars cost to society. So it is a real problem um, that we need to take seriously. The good thing is we have, you know, quite a few diagnostic tools. Um, I would say these top five, probably pretty much everyone should have in their clinic, um, even if you work in a really refractive based clinic that you can use to help in your diagnosis. Um, if you're more into advanced treatment, you can potentially get into these other diagnostic tools. Um, but we have a lot of really great stuff now to help us um, figure out what is going on with our patients. And we also now have a lot of great treatments. Um, you know, compared to back when I graduated in school, we have a lot more that we can do for patients. Um, and that's great. You know, it's, what's great about having a lot of options is we have a lot of options. Um, what's also bad is we have a lot of options. And so it can be really tough to figure out, well, how do I go about treating, you know, my patients? And while we have all these different treatments, you know, what's the main thing that they have in common? And it's that most of them are at-home treatments that the patient has to do at home, either eye drops they're putting in or lid hygiene. Um, and a lot of the time, we're asking our patients to do multiple of these at the same time. And so this is a high burden. It's a lot of things for patients to remember. Um, you know, really only a few of these are ones that we're doing in office. Noticed um, Trevia here, that's one of the newer neurostimulation um, treatments that's exciting, but again, is still an at-home treatment. And so kind of going along with that, you know, there are some downsides to our current ones, that high burden of time and effort. Um, compliance is really important. Symptoms often return if patients aren't compliant. There's a really expensive long-term cost. It's very likely that patients are going to have to be on some of these pharmaceuticals, you know, basically forever, and they're not cheap. A lot of them come with side effects like stinging and burning um, and have some limited effectiveness. Um, so the potential to have an in-office treatment that's effective that would decrease um, this burden on patients is really exciting. So, you know, that's where IPL comes in. So IPL or intense pulse light. It was used historically in dermatology um, for quite a while for things like rosacea, port wine stains, hair removal, um, acne. And back in 2002, 
kind of just by accident, um, Toyos noticed that in his patients with facial rosacea that were being treated for the rosacea with IPL, they also just happened to have improvements in their MGD and their dry eye. Um, and not just in their subjective symptoms, but actually objectively their tear breakup, their myobum gland secretion quality, lid margin quality uh, were all improved. And they also seemed better positioned for gland expression afterwards. So IPL essentially, it's a class two device. It's a non-laser high intensity light source that uses a flash lamp to produce a non-coherent light um, output in wavelengths in the range of 400 to 1200. We generally use wavelengths between like five, five um, and 600. It delivers controlled pulses of that intense light for only a few milliseconds duration that we will apply to the face and the eyelids. And then as the light passes through, you know, the different filters, only desired wavelengths will go through and the different wavelengths will, you know, sort of treat different things. So it, we have the divided pulses, which allow for safety and comfort. Um, and the way that the machines work now, um, there's a lot of good safety stuff built in. So you don't have to worry too much about, you know, the settings and everything like that, which makes it really easy. Okay, so you're like, yeah, but how does this light, you know, help with MGD. <laughs> so essentially it has that non-coherent light um, that I mentioned, which is absorbed by chromophores. So like melanin and hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a is the big one that basically when we apply IPL to the skin, the hemoglobin in the red blood cells absorbs that light. So if they're in those abnormal telogentasias, when that light is absorbed, it actually activates a coagulation process that leads to thrombosis of those abnormal vessels. So it's basically cutting them off. The reason we want to do that is because these telogentasias are a major source of inflammation to the eyelid and the meibomian glands. You know, they're bringing in all those inflammatory mediators. And by cutting off that reservoir of inflammation, we can hopefully interrupt that vicious, vicious cycle um, of inflammation that we mentioned before. So it's also thought to work through photobiomodulation, which um, is basically the process where it helps activate AT A ATP. Um, essentially, the light energy is absorbed by cytochrome C in the mitochondria. So if you remember your cell biology from years ago, um, that's active in the electron transport chain that improves ATP production. That will then facilitate a lot of cellular functions, as we know, including like collagen synthesis and fibroblasts, motility of immunoregulatory cells. IPL also is thought to kill Demodex. Again, it's absorbed by the chromophores in the exoskeleton of Demodex, which kills them. This helps decrease the load of the mites as well as the bacteria associated with them. IPL is also thought to suppress um, MMPs and then modulate, you know, pro and anti-inflammatory -infl cytokines and chemokines by upregulating up anti-inflammatory ones, downregulating the pro-inflammatory ones. This is a really nice diagram um, by Dell that just kind of, again, shows all the different mechanisms. Another way to kind of look at the mechanisms is to use uh, Dr. Perryman's BISTO model. So if you've ever gone to a talk that she's given, she talks about this BISTO model for understanding MGD, which is basically bugs, enzymes, inflammation, stasis of the mybum, temperature, and obstruction of the mybomian glands. And essentially, IPL helps target five out of the six of these, which is awesome. Um, we talked about, you know, decreasing that bacteria in Demodex. It impacts the enzymes, those lipases and esterases that affect enzymatic gene expression, mybum production, improves that cellular expression. Um, we know it decreases a lot of inflammatory mediators, markers. It also has been shown on confocal microscopy to improve the morphology of mybomian glands, um, improve the stasis of that as well as obstruction, um, hyperkeratinization of that lid margin. Um, the only one that it doesn't seem to actually really work too well on is the temperature. It doesn't seem to really heat uh, high enough for a long enough period of time. Uh, but what 
has been shown is that after you use IPL to control the inflammation, it does seem to set up the glands for better expre expressibility afterwards. So using IPL in conjunction with something like expression or thermal pulsation seems to work really well together. Um, if you know me or you follow my Instagram, you probably know that I'm like kind of obsessed with Demodex. So I did just want to show a really cool video um, that Fishman and Perryman did showing uh, death of a Demodex using IPL uh, in vitro. So I'm just going to go ahead and play that. I'll turn off that sound. But you can see the mite right here. He is kicking and alive. We're going to do a series of IPL shots using the Toyo settings. So we have this really cool video by Fishman and Perryman showing uh, death of Demodex in vitro using IPL. So we have the mite right here. You can see the legs moving. It's definitely alive. Going to hit it with a series of IPL shots using Toyo settings. So there's one pulse, two pulses, three pulses, you can see I'm kind of slowing down, four pulses, five pulses, and it stopped moving, six pulses, and you can see no movement anymore. And I think that was a seventh pulse. So um, kind of cool to see actually it working, you know, in vitro. So IPL, you know, again, I think a lot of people think of it sort of as this new treatment. It wasn't FDA approved for a long time, so we we're using it off label, but there's actually quite a lot of pure lit on it. There's, you know, strong scientific rationale for it. There is a bunch of studies here showing, you know, it improving tear breakup, meibomian gland secretion. So studies here, some more here, as well as here and here and here. So there's a ton. Um, so we know that there is good, you know, scientific rationale for using it. So what are the benefits of it over our current treatments? You know, one is that it shows really fast and effective improvement. We often see improvement after just one treatment in people. It saves a lot of that doctor and patient time we were talking about before. Compliance is improved because we don't have to have our patients do as many at home treatments. It saves us time. We're not having to do all the prior authorizations. Um, and dry eye becomes a procedure, you know, instead of just taking up chair time and then we're prescribing things and seeing patients back, we can actually sort of take control of the treatment. Um, and it's kind of nice that it has the side benefit of just the aesthetic um, improvement in patient's appearance as well. So, you know, now you're thinking, okay, well, how am I going to implement this into my practice? So there are three IPL um, systems that I'm familiar with. Um, the Optima, the M22 Optima by, by Luminous. Um, this is the one I think most people are most familiar with. It's just been around the longest. A lot of the literature has been done on this one. The newest development in it is it, the Optilite that came out earlier this year, which is a sort of small round light guide that makes getting around the eyelids a lot easier. There is also the E-Light by Topcon. Um, this is actually a combination with low-level light therapy. Um, nice thing about this one is you don't need any coupling gel. Um, and then lastly, and I realized when I was prepping this time, I don't actually know how to pronounce this one. I think it's E-I or E greater than I. Um, if any of you have this system and know how to pronounce it, um, please let me know. Um, this one, works slightly differently in that it uses something called intensive regulated pulse light or IRPL, where each pulse is actually divided into sub pulses and each sub pulse can have different light intensity and duration. So it seems like versus the traditional IPL, you get a little bit more control over the pulse rather than the fluence. Um, this is thought to have a slightly different mechanism where instead of focusing on the ablation of the abnormal blood vessels, it's supposed to work by neurological stimulation of the zygomatic nerve that would then increase the parasympathetic outflow to the meibomian and lacrimal glands. Um, I've noticed that it seems very popular 
in Canada. And I'm not sure exactly why if it just has approval there. Um, but it seems like a lot of the doctors I've seen that have it um, are, are up north in Canada. There have been quite a few studies on it that do show that it's quite effective, um, but I did find there was sort of a head-to-head -head study last year by Wu that compared the kind of traditional IPL to the IRPL, and it did seem like the traditional IPL um, was a little bit more effective at improving my bulbing gland secretion and lid margin scores, as well as non-invasive tear breakup. Um, but certainly, you know, depending on where you're practicing um, and what you're allowed to use, uh, it definitely seems like another effective option. So the newest updates, um, I think the most exciting one is that we got FDA approval for IPL as a treatment for MGD earlier this year. You know, it was used off label for a long time, um, which I think a lot of people are kind of makes people nervous, but now you don't have to worry about it. It is approved for use on skin types from Fitzpatrick one through four. And then also that Optilite I mentioned before, the, the smaller light guide is allowing for a lot easier treatment of the eyelid area. So how do we go about actually deciding what patients to treat? Like if you want to start implementing this into your clinic, how do you pick who to use it on? So of course, obviously your patients with rosacea, facial ocular rosacea, telegentasias, if you see a lot of demodex colorets, um, also just people that have had difficulty, you know, with adherence to their previous treatments or just didn't have um, good results with previous treatments. Um, we have a lot of patients that just don't want pharmaceutical treatments. They don't want to have to take an eye drop or an oral medication all the time. And then also for those with benign inflammatory skin lesions like acne and hordeola, um, chalasia. So there are um, some contraindications. Um, the main one is the amount of melanin in your skin. Um, so ironically, even though I'm giving a talk on IPL, I've never had IPL done myself because I'm a Fitzpatrick type five. The risk with having more melanin is it is one of the chromophores that IPL, the light, you know, will be absorbed by, and that can lead to depigmentation or hypopigmentation of the skin. So you want to be really careful in darker skinned individuals. Also, you aren't going to want to treat people with recent sun or tanning bed exposure, anyone with an active herpetic infection, um, tattoos in the treatment area want to be really careful of because, again, that pigment will absorb the light. Um, be cautious. Uh, don't want to treat anyone that's using a drug that causes photosensitivity like doxycycline. And then also with uh, wanted hair. So people that have beards or mustaches that they don't want to lose, you don't want to treat those areas because the IPL actually will um, you know, cause hair loss, sometimes permanent hair loss. Um, so don't, don't treat someone's beard if they don't want to lose their beard. Um, and then you also want to be careful with wounds as well. So the procedure itself, of course, we're the Perryman Eye Institute. We do the Perryman procedure um, that Dr. Perryman came up with. Um, but depending on your state regulations, you may just do the Toyos protocol, which is just sort of the under um, eye area here. With IPL, a lot of the laws regarding whether ODs can do it or not are, are kind of vague. So make sure that you're, you're following your state regulations. You know, talk with your board, potentially your malpractice attorneys um, to make sure that you are, you know, practicing within, within your scope and your state. Um, but I'm going to go through the full protocol. You may or may not do all of these actually in your own clinic. But the first thing you're going to want to do is that Fitzpatrick skin typing. I will show a slide that um, shows some examples of the different categories uh, next. Again, we like to use a questionnaire that goes over people's genetic heritage, the reactions to skin. Again, like I mentioned, you want to be cautious because of that depigmentation that's possible in darker skin. Typically do initially four treatments about two to four weeks apart. Three weeks is ideal. Um, and then after that, you may do maintenance treatments at different intervals, kind of depending on the patient's needs. Typically recommend starting with a more conservative treatment, particularly for first time treatments, just you know, start with the slightly lower settings. If anyone's had recent skin, skin sun, <laughs> recent sun exposure, um, or if their heritage, you know, would indicate sort of more darker pigmentation. 
And then adjust your subsequent treatments based on the patient's reaction. So if they do really well, you can maybe bump it up because obviously the higher settings are going to be more effective, but it's finding that balance between what, you know, is comfortable with your patient um, and doesn't cause too much of a reaction and then what's effective. You actually don't need to do manual expression right away. What we actually recommend is waiting till we have the inflammation controlled by IPL before pursuing some kind of expression. So this will usually be more like after the third or fourth treatment, then you could consider manual expression or something like a thermal pulsation system. So this goes over those Fitzpatrick uh, skin types. IPL, you can pretty much safely do one through four, and that's what it's FDA approved for. And as you can see, the fluent settings will vary depending on the skin type. So the pre-procedure, essentially, we want to clean off any face eye makeup. We recommend using um, these wipes that we like. Um, we want to pull any hair back, and we like to give patients a stress ball to squeeze because not going to lie, the treatment's kind of spicy and people might need to clench something so that they don't start cussing at you. <laughs> um, we then instill a drop of paracaine, non-preserved artificial tear, um, and then we insert sterilized laser-grade corneal shields to protect the eye. You may use stickers instead. We like the corneal shields because we like to treat on the eyelids, but again, whatever, you know, kind of works for you. Then you're going to want to apply a thin to medium layer of clear ultrasound gel. Be really careful not to get it into the eye because it can be really irritating. We like to use a tongue depressor for this. Um, I do have some videos I'm going to show later where the gel is really thick. Um, the videos were recorded like a couple years ago before we, we sort of figured out that actually less gel works better. So don't use as much gel as in, as in those videos. So the overall perimen protocol, we first like to start with some test spots. So we usually do this kind of on the side of the face here. And this is just to make sure the, treat, the patient can tolerate it. You want to have sort of a light pinkening of the skin after the test spots and if everything's looking good. You can adjust your settings if you need to or just keep going forward. The first step in the perimen protocol is a full face rosacea pass. So actually go one pass over the entire face. Settings will kind of depend on the clinical findings. After that, we do step two, which are the Toyo settings. Some people just do the Toyo settings. These ones, you go from tragus to tragus across the nose, doing a double pass, so two passes. Um, for all of this, you want to be really careful not to apply pressure because the pressure is actually going to crunch those telegentasias and blanch them, and you're going to push out those hemoglobin, and so there won't be anything for to absorb the light energy and then, you know, be coagulated. So don't put any pressure. Overlap your um, pulses by like about 10%. After that, we treat the eyelids, switching to the small light guide, and basically we'll go around, I think usually about three on top, three on the bottom, um, and again, a double pass. You want to make sure to avoid the lashes by at least two millimeters. And then after that, pending on your state regulations, if you can, we like to do an aesthetic cleanup. It's just kind of, you know, a nice gift to our patients, get any of uh, those sort of angiomas or hyperpigmented spots that you see. Um, if someone has a little roach in here or something you want to get rid of, um, you can do that for them. It, you know, it takes just like a couple extra seconds and patients are really appreciative of it. There is a series of videos that I have. Um, in the interest of time, probably not going to show all of them, um, but they are available on YouTube. If you go to dryeyemaster.com, it has all the videos. Um, so I'll play just a short portion of this first one, which goes over that step one full face rosacea. Right. So again, this kind of goes over the different settings you'll want to use. We do use the M22, um, but of course you can adjust this for whatever system that you use. Again, don't use this much gel. Got those corneal shields in place. So those are those first test ones.
be overlapping about 10%. It's just going to go across essentially the entire face, including the chin and then the forehead. So I won't show the whole thing. Um, but again, you can find that on YouTube, Dry Eye Master. And then I may actually just show this last one, which is removal of the corneal shields. A lot of people ask how to do these. And, and honestly, if you're, if you're good with removing contacts or sclerals, there, there should be no problem for you. But it, it's kind of a nice video. Well, that's Dr. Perryman and our uh, esthetician Raquel is going to be removing them. We want to get all that gel off. Yeah, super easy. Looks really creepy when they're in, but actually inserting and removing them um, isn't that bad at all. So post-procedure, um, immediately after you're going to want to remove that gel um, with the long edge of the tongue depressor, um, you can use a gauze if you need to wipe off any residual gel. Wipe the face with warm water, and then you want to pat sunscreen in. The treatment does put you more at risk for sunburn, so definitely use SPF right after. We like the Kinesis Unscented sunscreen. Um, and then we'll often put in just a drop of Lumify or diluted Alpha-GAN. Um, from having put in those corneal shields. In the following days, you know, for at least a week, you'll want to really avoid sun exposure, use SPF kind of right after, try to avoid essentially anything that would cause the blood vessels to dilate. So exercise, hot tubs, excess alcohol, those kinds of things. So, you know, it's a procedure that is not without potential side effects. A lot of the main ones, most people will probably have is some reddening, pinking of the skin, sometimes some mild edema, potentially some hypo or hyperpigmentation. Singing and burning um, is quite common and mild pain. And then of course the hair loss uh, that I'd mentioned before. So most of these are pretty mild and will resolve within a week other than the hair loss. So just warn patients sort of expect this. If of course it, it doesn't go away for them, them to see you back. And then um, lastly, I figured we'd go into a couple cases that we uh, saw, have done, seen in our clinic. Um, the first one is just a really, you know, standard rosacea patient. So these are kind of the ones that you know will likely do well with, uh, with IPL. So we had a 39-year-old patient that had really severe rosacea, cured conjunctivitis, sloppy eyelid syndrome. He had come in with a reduced uh, best corrected VA um, and had, you know, been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea and alcohol dependency. And so you can see before when he presented, you know, back about a year ago, there's a lot of edema and inflammation here. We did six IPL treatments, um, you can see a huge improvement in these meibomian glands, you know, they're just so much less inflamed, the meibography normalized, expressibility normalized, and the vision also normalized. So he did quite well with, it did take six treatments, um, but it was quite effective. We also have used it for patients with prostaglandin-induced ocular surface disease. So, you know, obviously prostaglandins are great options for glaucoma, but we're very familiar with the ocular surface side effects. This patient, of course, you know, we don't want to take patients off these medications because they need them to treat their glaucoma, but we do need to treat that ocular surface disease and that MGD and dry eye. So for this 70-year-old patient that had been on prostaglandins for a decade, and you can see a lot of this reddening of the lid margin, it's just kind of angry here. We did three treatments on him and you can see a significantly just improved appearance proved his symptoms, and then also just aesthetically, you know, it looks so much nicer. Um, you know, our patients on these prostaglandins, a lot of them are really embarrassed by how their eyes and their eyelids look. So this is a really nice option that we can give them. And another kind of cool case that we saw 
earlier this year and last year is for something called DIOSD or dupilumab induced ocular surface disease. I think this is something that we as eye doctors are going to start seeing a lot more in clinics, basically related to Dupixent or dupilumab, which is a treatment for eczema that came out about four years ago. Um, and it is very effective for eczema. The downside is it blocks IL-13, which affects the goblet cell. So while it's it's clearing up people's eczema <laughs> excellently, it causes this uh, separate conjunctivitis ocular surface disease that we need to treat. And kind of like with patients using prostaglandins for glaucoma, we don't want to take patients off the dupixin. Like they need it for their eczema, but we need to be able to control um, the conjunctivitis and the ocular surface disease that is, is showing up. Typically, it's controlled with things like topical steroids or lithidograst. Um, so we had this patient had come in also about a year ago. We had started her on lodopredinol and lithidograst. And, you know, she was a mom with a few kids. She just had a really hard time keeping compliant with the therapy. And so it just wasn't really clearing up. We knew that IPL was an effective treatment for inflammation. And so we thought, well, let's, let's try IPL. And as you can see in the photos down here, I mean, it caused immediate improvement. Um, we ended up doing a series of IPLs when she initially came in back in October. Um, and then due to kind of, you know, those adherence issues with the topicals, she'd ended up coming back in March with another flare up and we did three more treatments. You can see her presentation back in October, just how angry and inflamed this is, you know, then compared to after all our treatments here with significant improvement and she didn't have to worry as much about keeping up with her at home treatments. Um, we actually did um, write this up as a poster at Academy and it's in submission right now in the Journal of Dry Eyes. So should hopefully be able to read about the case um, sometime in the near future. Lastly, one of the things we are working on in our clinic is IPL as a treatment for chalasia. So this is a series of photos of a few different patients where we treated some acute chalasia and showed pretty, in, pretty nice improvement, you know, just five days post IPL, you know, without a need for either surgery, <laughs> surgical um, removal, or something like an oral medication. Um, could be a nice treatment option for that as well. So what's next? You know, we I had talked a lot about how you can really only treat up to type four. With really careful treatment, we're thinking potentially we could treat type five. This is exciting for me because I'm a type five. Um, so we we're actually thinking about testing this out maybe in the winter when I'm kind of my, my most palest. We want to be really careful with that. You know, Dr. Perryman has been doing this for a long time. So which she trusts her experience to do it, but this is something you will want with time to decide if you feel comfortable doing. As a non-surgical treatment for chalasia, it's actually in clinical trial right now, so that could be a really exciting option for that. And then also just using IPL in combination with the low-level light therapy and things like radio frequency, I think we'll be just, we will gain more information about that going forward. So in conclusion, Intense full sight has been shown to be a really effective treatment for MGD and dry eye disease. It works through multiple mechanisms of action and, you know, is a really excellent addition to our current treatment toolkit. It's anti-inflammatory and it's an in-office procedure, so it eliminates a lot of that burden um, of adherence for our patients. And it's fun to do it out. You know, if you're into procedures, it's actually kind of fun to do break up your, your normal exam flow. And it has a, the nice side benefit of those aesthetic benefits. Like your, you know, your patient's skin is going to look better. They're going to get rid of all those togentasias. Um, so it's really nice. So, you know, even if you aren't necessarily going to be able to implement it in your clinic, I think being aware of, of how it works and its benefits and knowing who in your area does it that you could refer to um, is very useful. So I hope that you were able to gain a little bit better understanding of it and where it fits in in your um, treatment thoughts for your patients. So these are my references and then um, contact info if you want to contact us. This is our practice in the Queen Anne neighborhood of Seattle. Um, my email here, 
not gonna lie, I'm a, I'm a true millennial and probably more likely to respond to an Instagram message <laughs> than I am to the email, but feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Um, and if you're more interested in finding out about our practice, um, you can go to dryeyemaster.com. All right, thank you. Hi, Dr. Mighty, welcome to the Q&A for the session. A so great of a lecture. I just am so excited that there's this new treatment option. It's been out forever, but new FDA approved treatment. Um, and the fact that it's actually treatment category two in the Dues 2 report just makes it so great and accessible great option for our patients. Um, we had tons of questions in the chat. So people are so interested in learning more about this. So I hope you're ready. Um, yes, first thing we we'll start off with is what is the typical cost of therapy? Um, and then thinking about like a treatment protocol, how many treatments are in there? I know you mentioned four, but also how often are you recommending that this is repeated? Yeah. So, you know, of course what you're going to charge for the treatment is up to your discretion. Um, most of us know these systems are pretty expensive, so you do have to charge, you know, to, to um, make up for that cost. Um, I'd say how practice is implemented really varies from clinic to clinic. We, at our clinic, we do every procedure a la carte, so there'll be a set price for IPL, you know, or thermal pulsation, all that. Some clinics will bundle things to make it a little bit easier for the patient, but, you know, I'd say anywhere from like three to six hundred dollars per treatment is pretty average mm -hmm. um, and you can figure out what makes sense uh, for your clinic. I think that's great that there's a lot of flexibility with it you know unlike some of the other treatment options where there's a really hefty individual price this obviously doesn't come with that so it makes it a little bit more accessible in that manner. Right. And as for timing of treatments um, exactly we usually recommend you know about four initially and try to space them about two to four weeks apart. We found that the ideal is about three weeks in between. Um, some patients, of course, depending on what they've got going on, may require more treatments than that. You just sort of had to gauge how they're doing after that fourth one. Um, it's quite common for patients, you know, after that first series to maybe six months or a year out also need follow-up treatment. So it's really going to vary from patient to patient. Okay, great. Um, so when you're first bringing a patient in, deciding to do this, I know it's really important to do the test spot. So what exactly are you looking for when you do that test spot to know if the patient's really a good candidate and going to respond appropriately? Right. So um, there's a couple of things. One is you just want to, you're seeing how is the skin going to react to the treatment. So if you actually, um, in the videos that I showed from Dry Eye Master on YouTube, um, actually, I think one of the very first ones actually shows us doing the test spot. And then you can see what you want to see is a little light pinkening of the skin. Um, and so that'll show, and actually the video shows pretty well, like what a good reaction is. Mm -hmm. And then you're also gauging this patient comfort. Like if, if you, any of you have had IPL done, you know, like it kind of stings. It's like the most comfortable sensation. And some patients are able to tolerate that more than others. If a patient says, nope, that's too much, then you may want to, you know, decrease your setting. So that helps you gauge if you can maybe go up a little bit or down a little bit. And then pending how, you know, they react to the rest of the treatment, that can change how you go about your um, follow-up treatments. But yeah, check out the video if you're curious about like what a good test spot actually looks like. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, would it be okay to treat someone who has both like your rosacea and trying to get rid of the vascular uh, redness and pigmented spots on the same day? Yeah. I mean, I think that's really up to you how much time you have in clinic. I mean, honestly, once you've got the whole setup with the shields and the gel and stuff, it almost makes more sense to go ahead and just do more in that same session right than like have necessarily having them come back. But that's just going to be up to how much time you have set aside to do those things um, in each session. Okay, great. Um, can you reiterate just the important thing? Because obviously this is something new. A lot of us have never had any experience with it. Obviously, I think, you know, picking patients is, is kind of the easy part here. Who should not have this done? So just reiterate a couple of your contraindications for the procedure. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know the main one is basically skin pigmentation. You know, e honestly, I am probably out of the range for IPL because melanin is going to absorb that same energy. It can lead to things like depigmentation. So that's going to be your main one right now. 
we're sort of working a little bit to see if we can maybe get darker skin tones treated, but that's going to be the primary one. Um, and then anything that's going to absorb the energy. So things like tattoos, tattoo eyeliner, you're going to want to be very careful with. We already mentioned you don't, you know, you want to stay a couple millimeters away from the lashes and the eyebrows. So, you know, if you're able to get a good distance away from that tattoo eyeliner, you should be okay. Um, but we want to be careful of anything that is going to absorb that energy, um, as well as patients that are on certain medications that can cause photosensitivity. So things like doxycycline, retinols, like all those kinds of things. Um, you know, patients don't necessarily need to discontinue those things forever, but they will when you're doing the treatments. Um, Dr. Perryman has kind of found that she is able to sometimes treat patients while they're on doxy and things like that, if she just kind of goes at a lower level. But, but figuring out your comfort with that just comes with years of experience. So I think starting out more conservatively and just being like, okay, I want you to get off your docs for like a week before we do it is I think certainly a safe bet. Okay. No, that makes complete sense. Um, I know you talked about a lot about in the video about the, you know, treating the Demodex is crazy to watch. Um, is it okay to treat Demodex in patients who don't have rosacea as well? Or are you really keeping it for patients who have, you know, Demodex as a result of their rosacea? No, I mean, I think it would be totally reasonable. To, like if Demodex is like the main clinical finding that you see, I think it would be totally reasonable for that. Luckily, there's currently also some topical medications for Demodex in clinical trial right now. So we may have another option that um, may be slightly easier for patients than something like IPL. But yeah, I think I think that would be a totally legitimate reason to use it. That's great. And what do you think about uh, hair loss? Is that something that you're concerned about? Have you seen it a lot in clinical practice? Yeah, I mean, I would say facial hair loss or removal is a pro for some people and a negative for some people. So some of your patients may really love that you're getting rid of some of their chin hairs. Um, and then some, you know, that want to have a beard or mustache won't want you to. So we are very careful to ask people to say like, hey, are you okay with us treating here? Particularly um, for men with beards, we'll sometimes say like, hey, are you okay with us treating up here? It'll get rid of some of these little hairs. So it's, sometimes it's just a matter of like, well, like, where do you want to keep the hair and where do you not? Um, so you, you do need to be careful about where you're treating. I'd say, you know, many of us older women are totally cool with getting rid of some of, some of these little <laughs> hairs. And then, you know, same with like eyebrows, you're going to want to be careful not to treat like too close to that. Yeah, that makes total sense. I would be very sad if you got rid of my eyebrows. <laughs> right. <laughs> But you know, uh, least chin hair or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Really <laughs> Uh, well, this is so awesome. I'm really excited about IPL. I think, um, you know, the new device that's just been FDA approved is really great that it's easier to treat for dry eye. You know, I've actually had IPL quite a few times. I have rosacea myself. So I really, I'm excited to see this applied into the dry eye space. I think it's going to be a big, big life changer for a lot of our patients. So Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm just going to jump into some logistics about the program. Um, I'm sure that everybody noticed that I put the last raffle code for the day in the chat. That was edema if you did miss it. Um, tomorrow, we have such an exciting schedule for you. We have three continuing education lectures in this track that I'll be moderating. Um, they're all focusing on anterior segment management. We have one on dry eye, one on collaborative refractive surgery care, and another on the treatment of neurotrophic care. Titus. So please, please, please uh, stop in for those tomorrow. Lectures start at 7.30 Pacific or 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. And I do want to, again, thank all of our sponsors for the program. We have 22 vendors. If you haven't gotten a chance to check out the exhibit hall, please do that. Um, and also right now I'm going to bump everybody over to our exhibit hall to go chat with my classmate, Matt Geller, about the wrap up for the day. And I hope that everyone is able to enjoy a little bit of wine. I have my Jessup Cellar wine with me uh, for the evening and we'll see you back in the morning. Thank you so much.